Hey, let me begin uh, by wishing all of our dads a happy Father's Day. We didn't forget you. Just wanted to pause at this time and do it. Dads, uh, you got a tough job, and uh, none of us are perfect at it. Uh, but I appreciate you for being here today and uh, for the examples that you set in your home. I appreciate you being hardworking dads. Uh, you know, God values hardworking men, and it's important. And uh, so thank you for, for being providers. Uh, but also, don't forget, dads, uh, you're, you're called to be spiritual providers, too, in your home. And so step up to the plate for that challenge too. Thank you for what you do here in this church and for how you serve God. And uh, we, we got you a little something. Uh, I know many of you are like me and you, you probably need a cupcake this week. So on the way out, we got a little gift certificate for you to stop by Cupcakes Y'all this week and you get a free cupcake, all right? And you can, you can ask for the, for the low-fat, no-calorie one, okay? They don't have it, but you can ask for it. Right now, I'd like to have all of our dads stand up so we can see dads all the way across this room. Wherever you are, dads, stand up. Amen. Appreciate all of you. I'm glad God put you in this church. You may be seated. Hey, today we're going to finish this uh, series we started uh, many weeks ago about being all in uh, for the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, being devoted to him more than we are, uh, being more dedicated to him than we are. There's always room for more of that. And uh, I want to tell you a story today to, to get us thinking about being all in one more time. Now, the sermon series about being all in ends today, but, but our need to be all in doesn't. Just like the series before this, you remember these wristbands talk about just one? Hey, the series is over, but the need to be focused on just one person, bringing them to Christ, how important just one person is. That series is over, but our need for this is not. So the, so the series will end, but, but all in is going to go with us. But I have a pretend story to tell you today. And when you hear this story, you're going to think, oh, that would, you know, obviously that's make-believe because that would never happen to Pastor Donnie and his wife, all right? So this is all just made up, okay? So get, you know, revert back to first grade when you used to pretend and pretend like Joyce and I are on our favorite vacation, which is a cruise. We like to go on cruise ships. They're, they're really not that expensive. So we're on a cruise, and you got to pretend that the only reason that we were ever in the casino on the ship was because you can go through the casino as a shortcut to get to the, to the other end of the ship. So pretend we're walking through the casino, and pretend there's a roulette table there, and pretend that before I could stop her, Joyce chunks down $2 on the roulette table at, at 35 to 1 odds. And then let's pretend she won. $70. Let's pretend that made me happy. <laughs> All right? Uh, let, let's pretend there's this little imaginary little old lady at the, at the table there. And she just jumps up and down with excitement. And, and she begins to hug Joyce and grab her and pat her on the back and say, young lady, you're so lucky. Bet it all. Go all in. Go all in. And that's where the story stops because if the rest of it was true, I, I, it would hurt too much to tell you. Okay? So you can, add, you, can, you can carry on in your imagination what happened after that. But I want to make a point from that. It's easy to tell someone else to go all in, isn't it? It's really easy to sit on this side of the room and look across the room and say, well, you know, I mean, I, I don't really have to go in all in for Christ because surely somebody else over there will. But see, this whole series is, is about going all in yourself. You know, we need to help each other go all in. We need to encourage each other to go all in. But can I tell you, the best way to do that is through your own example of being all in for the cause of Christ, to show people what it's like, to, to help teach people what it looks like, sounds like, acts like, feels like, to be all in for Christ. And that, that's, that's why that we, we've gone back to the very first church to let those people who were all in for Christ in a church that was all in for Christ help us be challenged to be all in for Christ. 
And, and they're a good example because, you know, we're reading about the very first day and the, the first few days after that church. It was a time when they had not yet been corrupted by false teaching. And, and, and they had not yet been distracted by other things. So we're building a list by just looking at that church, a list of possible indicators that you're all in. Now, these aren't guarantees that you're all in because if you look at this list, including what we add to it today to, to finish it, you can do everything on this list for the wrong reason. You can do everything on this list just because you're used to being a churchy person you can do everything on this list just out of religious habit or everything on this list can be done out of devotion to the cause of Christ and then it will help indicate that you're all in. So one more time before we finish this series and this list, look at one of the, the bedrock scriptures for this series up here. Joshua 3, 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Remember, the Israelites... Finally, they're on the banks of the Jordan River, and just across the river is the, is the land they dreamed of, the promised land that God said would be theirs. And across the river, there, God said, there's amazing things for me to do over there. But there are also risks over there. There are also challenges across the river. It's safer to stay on the side that they were on. But the amazing things were on the other side. And God said, if you want to see them, if you want to cross the river and see what I can do, consecrate yourselves. That's a big old church word that has a real simple meaning. It means go all in. It means devote yourself to the cause of Christ like you never have before. Now the Israelites were pretty much, they, they, they were pretty all in or they wouldn't have been there. But the message is there's always room for more. Why is that? Uh, there's, there's always room to go more all in because God always has more amazing things. God never runs out of amazing things. The, the, the question is, are we satisfied or do we want to see more amazing things? See, that God's got places he wants this church to go. He's got places that he wants you as an individual to go. There are rivers to cross, but it's more dangerous on the other side than it is here. There are some risks over there. might cost you something. might challenge you in ways that, you, that we've never been challenged as a church. But that's where the amazing things are where God wants to lead us. So are we satisfied or are we willing to go more all in so we can see those things? Let's finish our list by going back to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. We start in Acts 2, 41, and then we just read on in the next few days of that church, and we make a list of what they did, what they thought, what they practiced, how they acted. Acts 2, 41 is the first day of the church. The first worship service is concluding. The, the, the first response to God's word preached in the New Testament church is in verse 41. Acts 2.41, those who accepted his message were baptized. Now what does that mean? It accepted his message, that means they believed Peter's message that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins. It means they knew they were sinners. They were convicted that they were messed up like we are. And that Jesus died on the cross to pay for their sins. They accepted that. They accepted that he rose from the dead. They accepted that he had the power to forgive them. And they accepted that they had to ask him for it. And then they got baptized to show it. So those who accepted the message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, let, let me just, if you're, if you're one of those OCD people where everything has to be right in order, I'm going to rock your whole world right now because I'm going to skip the next point in the outline. So I'm, I promise I'll come back to it and we'll clean it all up nice and neat. 
but, but don't get nervous. We're going to skip uh, 9I, and we're going to start with 9J, okay? So you write in there on 9J. If you're one of those people that writes on the outline, write the word worship. Because worship can be an indicator of where your heart is. It can be an indicator of whether or not you're all in. It doesn't always do that because we can just be here in our mind, in our heart, and our thoughts be somewhere else. Or we can be here to praise God and acknowledge his worth. But I call you to the attention of verses 46 and 47 where there's just a summary that basically says those people regularly got together to worship God. And they praised him on a regular basis together. So I, I ask you, would, would, you know, without trying to hurt your feelings, are you a regular here in worship? Or, or do you just kind of throw in some worship when you can, when, you're, when your life and your schedule allows? And when you do come, are, is, is every part of you here? Your mind and your heart and not just your backside in a chair? See, because we can do this thing called worship for the wrong reason. And, and can you worship alone? Yes. Can you worship anywhere? Yes. But can I just tell you, according to God's word, there is no substitute for what we are doing now in this room together. It says they did it together. Hebrews 10.25 says, Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. You know, as, as a boy from Arkansas would say, don't stop going to church. Why is that? Because there's something that we do together here when we join our hearts and we join our voices and, and we join ourselves in worshiping God Almighty. There's something that we do together here that you cannot get alone. And I'll tell you, there's an excuse that I've heard throughout my ministry career that just makes me grind my teeth. It's when somebody says, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I, I, I watch TV at home and I worship by myself. Well, yeah, you can be a Christian without going to church. You know, I mean, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> but there's something important that happens here. Okay, and, and yes, you can be a Christian without going to church. But I'm just going to tell you, according to God's word, it's a lie that you say you can, be the, you, you can be the Christian God wants you to be by not doing what we're doing here together. It's an absolute, it's, it's, I started to say something else. I'll say nonsense. It's nonsense for you to say that you're all in for Jesus when, when worship is not a priority in your life. It, it's, it's crazy. Because worship is one thing that indicates that God is a priority in your life. If we're here for the right reasons, it can help indicate that we're all in. Look around the room. You see empty chairs. You know why that is? Because worship is not a priority enough in some people's lives. We're just like every other church. Uh, there's some of you I see every Sunday... Now, here's where I, you know, I'm probably going to offend you. Some of you I see every Sunday, and some of you I see occasionally. Why is that? Because worship's not enough of a priority. Just one Sunday before I die and go to heaven, I'd like to see the whole church together. Just once. You know what? All in people make this a priority and then they schedule the rest of their life around their priorities with God. And it helps show whether or not we're all in. So let me ask you just between you and God, you're here today and I'm thankful. But it, does your presence here today, what does it indicate? Does it indicate that you're all in or does it just indicate that you're here? See, that's the difference. All right, we go on to, what is it, nine, uh, nine K? I promise you, OCD folks, we're going back, all right? But right now, 9K, write the word growth in. Do you know that growth is a potential indicator of whether or not we as a church are all in and whether or not you as an individual are all in? Verse 47 says, the Lord added daily. He, he added daily. 
to their number, those who were being saved. People's lives were being changed every day and they were joining that church. Acts 4, 4 says their number grew to 5,000. We've already seen they added 3,000 the first day. Now, they, now it grows to 5,000. How did they know how many people there were? They counted. They counted. I don't want to hear that numbers aren't important. Numbers for the sake of numbers are not important. But when every one of those numbers represents a living human being precious to God whose life has been changed, I want to know if the numbers are going up because then I, I, I get to rejoice at what God is doing. Seven more times in the first part of Acts, it talks about their number growing. Don't tell me numbers aren't important. And then in Acts 9.31, there's a significant addition. It says, 9, 9.31 says they grew in number and the church was strengthened. Now that's a key addition. They continued to grow numerically, but by saying the church was strengthened, it talks about the other important kind of growth that the church needs. That's spiritual growth. They go together. Spiritual growth, where you, where you understand more of who God is and your faith grows and your understanding of Scripture and your application of Scripture in your life grows, that leads to numerical growth. Why is that? Because the more you grow in your faith and your understanding and your relationship with God, guess what? The more you'll be concerned about people out there who are dying and going to hell. And you'll be out there telling them about Jesus and you'll be bringing them here. So growth, the growth of the church and, and our individual growth as believers can be indicators of whether or not we're all in. And one without the other is indicative of a problem. They go together. Let me show you how they can come one without the other. Let me tell you a story. Uh, one time Joyce and I were, were sitting on a couch and we were watching television. And uh, I'm glad she's not here to amen this. Uh, and she wanted to lie down, so she got a pillow, and she put it in my lap, and she snuggled up on the pillow and kind of put her head up against my stomach, and she looked up at, at me, and she said, you know, I just love your stomach. She said, it is so soft. <laughs> said, it's just like having another pillow. Ladies, that is not a compliment to your man, okay? <laughs> Don't tell him that his stomach is as soft as a pillow. But in the interest of honesty, I have to tell you, since I retired from the Army almost 10 years ago, I have grown. <laughs> but it's only been quantity growth. It hadn't been quality growth. I have, I have added about 25 pounds of pillow. It's not 25 pounds of muscle. Can I tell you, churches are in danger of that same kind of growth, not just fat pastors. There are a few of those, but... but they're in danger of quantity growth that has no quality with it. They're in danger of just, of just more people without more depth spiritually. They go together. But then there are churches that, that aren't growing numerically that will claim, well, we're really deep spiritually, though. I don't think so, or you'd be growing numerically. But then as individuals, we face the same danger. Think back with me right now to the day you claim you trusted Jesus. Now, I don't remember the exact day in my life. I remember the year and I remember where I was. So surely you remember in, in some terms where you were when you trusted Jesus. When was that? Now, what I want you to do is, is tell me, just between you and God, don't tell me, what is different about your life from that day to now? That will tell you if you've grown spiritually. If church is no more important to you now than it was then, all you're doing is growing older. You're not growing in quality. If you're no more committed today than you were then to God's word, if you're no more committed now than, than you were then to being involved in church and serving, then all you're doing is getting fat. And the spiritual depth isn't there. They go hand in hand. And all in churches grow both ways. Numerically and spiritually. Now, let's go back up to 9i. And, and the part that, that nobody wants to hear about. 
is I'm going to tell you to write in for that blank, write the word money in. And, and I, I could hear some, some air being sucked out of the room, as I said, M-O-N-E-Y in church. Now, you know, studies show that one of the top four reasons that a lot of people don't go to church is that there's too much talk about money in too many churches. And yet, here I am talking about it. Why am I doing that? Because verse 45 talks about M-O-N-E-Y. It says, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had in need. Now, if they sold their possessions, what would they get in return for it? M-O-N-E-Y. Thank you. And, and, and they gave money. Other places in Acts show us clearly that they gave their money through the church. And so how honest with you would I be if I, if I left this part out? Because i got to be honest with you. According to the scripture, what you do with your money, whether or not you give some to the church, and the attitude with which you give it is a key indicator of whether or not you're all in. Because where our money is, is generally where our heart is. And Before you tune me out, as just another preacher begging for money, can I just tell you right up front, my God does not beg, and I don't beg on his behalf. So don't you interpret this as me begging you for money. Ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you the truth. But I'm not begging for anything. The second thing is, before you accuse me of, of talking too much about money, those uh, very few of you have been here the whole time, but I've been in this church nine years and seven months. That's 490-some Sundays. And I went back through my, my sermon files. You know how many times I've spoken directly about money in 490-plus opportunities? Five times. So we don't talk a lot about money here, but we're going to talk about it today because the honest truth is it's an indicator of whether or not you're all in. Now, this may contradict, what I'm going to say may contradict what you've always been taught in church. God rest her soul, uh, Bernice Boyd, and what she taught me in second grade Sunday school was wrong. Okay? How many of you were taught growing up in church that tithing is how you're supposed to give? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Tithing, giving 10%. That's the word tithe. That's what it means, 10%, a tenth. I, I'm, I'm going to upset, upset your apple cart today. Tithing is not taught in the New Testament. It's not. Tithing is not the model. It is not the standard for giving for the church. Tithing is taught in the Old Testament. Just It's a part of the law. The law, we don't live under the law now, do we? Since the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, what do we live under? Grace. Jesus fulfilled the law. And so the need to, for us to check every little block in the law is over. We live by grace and a relationship with God. Well, tithing was part of the law, just like what those people could and could not eat. How many of you like pork? You better stop eating it if, if, you're tith if, you, if you claim tithing is the rule. Okay, you better go through the Old Testament and figure out what you should and shouldn't eat. How many of you like seafood? Oh, you better stop eating that stuff. All right. It's part of the Old Testament law, just like the, the temple sacrifice was. They were told what animals to sacrifice and when to sacrifice them and how to do it. If you're claiming that, that, that tithing is the rule for giving, uh, you, you better be cut, uh, cutting up some sheet in your backyard soon. And you better hope your neighbors don't report you, okay? <laughs> what am I saying? The Bible teaches if you say that, you, that you're going to live by the law, then you have to live by all of it. And tithing is not taught in the New Testament. Tithing is mentioned twice in the New Testament. And both times it is mentioned prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus, which means that the law was still in effect. And the law for us essentially ended with the resurrection of Christ. And so let me show you what the New Testament standard for giving is. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give, and that's talking about M-O-N-E-Y, each man should give 
what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's talking about giving money. And when it says what he has decided in his heart to give, that's not you making up the amount on your own. It's deciding in your heart means it's between you and God. But it's nobody's business except God's to tell you how much to give. It's not my job. It's not, it's, it's not some rule that we live under. It's not some church that's looking at your, your pay stub. I've told you before, I could take you to a church today. If you want to join that church, you've got to show them proof of income. And they're going to get the calculator out and they're going to figure out what 10% is. And they're going to say, this is the amount you owe the church this year. And if you fall behind, you're going to get an encouraging letter in the middle of the year telling you to catch up on your giving. I could take you to a church where the pastor knows who gives what because he will stand in a pulpit and he doesn't call names, but he'll say, I know who's giving what. Some of you aren't giving enough. That's not the standard for giving, public pressure. Can I be honest with you? You know how long I'd stay in those churches? Long enough to get out the door. That's it. Because that's not the New Testament standard. That is the New Testament standard. You get on your knees before God and you say, God, how much do you want me to give? And then you give what he tells you to give. And you give it cheerfully. It's a higher standard. You know, if you say that, that tithing is the rule, then guess what? There are three different tithes mentioned in the Old Testament. Two of them are annual, which means there's 20%. And one of them is every third year, which would make it about 3%. So if you're going to say, hey, I, Pastor, you're wrong. Tithing is the rule. You better start giving 23%. Because that's the rule. But we, don't, we, we live under grace. We, we have a relationship with God. He, he relates to us and tells us what to give, and then we, we happily give it. That's the New Testament standard. I, I tell you... The New Testament standard for giving is not coercion, it's not public pressure, it's not pastor guilt. It, you know, don't sit there and say, well, he's trying to guilt us into giving more. Hey, if that was it, I would have guilted you a long time ago, okay? It, it, we don't give because of what we get out of it, except the blessing we get in return for being part of God's work. Do you know that when, when we pass the offering baskets here, it's not an interruption, it's not a pause in worship, it's part of worship. Giving back to God some of what he's given you is an act of worship. And that's how all-in people give. They give because they're worshiping God when they drop that, that money in the basket. I'll tell you another thing that, that New Testament giving is not. It, it, is, it is not about what you get back. Now, according to that scripture, you're going to get something back. If, if you just give a little, you're going to get a little back. If you give a lot, you get a lot back. But I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that that's an investment plan with God because the, the, the greatest uh, portion of blessing you're going to get back is not material, it's spiritual. You get the blessing of knowing that, that your money contributed to his work. You get the blessing of worshiping him. So there's no guaranteed rate of return. But, you know, in Naples, Florida, several years ago, there was a guy who went to a church, and, and the pastor talked about tithing and said, you know, you, you, if you give 10%, God will give you more in return. And so he started giving 10%, and after a while, the return on his investment wasn't there, and he actually sued the church. Now, thank God he didn't win, but in today's courts, he might win. That's why we're taping this. If you take me to court, it's on record that I did not, I did not give, promise you a certain rate of return. But the point is, I want you to understand, I, I'm not talking about money to beg you or coerce you. I'm, I'm talking about it because it's, it's where your money is helps indicate where your heart is. You know, we do things in this church uh, maybe differently than you're used to. We meet every December and, and we have a vote. A budget is presented and we vote. We met last December and we voted for, for a budget of $822,000 this year. Now, before you say, wow, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. 
But you know, we have over 2,000 members in this church. You know what the annual budget is of most churches with 2,000 members? About two and a half million dollars. We operate on less than a third. It's a, it's a little over $68,000 a month adds up to that budget. We have five complete months so far. We're in month six now. We haven't taken in that much money in any month this year. I'm not begging. I'm informing you. We're about $40,000 behind so far this year. Does that mean we're $40,000 in the red? No, because we're not the federal government. We don't print money. and We don't spend more than we take in. It means we cut back. And I'm telling you that because I want you to know that every penny you put in that plate, we we take seriously as a staff, and we're not frivolous. We we do we do more with less money than most churches do. I'm telling you that though. To be honest, one of the reasons that we're behind is not enough of our people are all in with their money. I don't think enough of our people are getting on their knees and saying, "God, what do you want me to give?" You see. It's easier to hide behind a tithe. It's easier to say, well, i got to give 10%. Check the block, 10%. Because you never know. You get on your knees and God say, hey, you can afford 15%. He might tell some of you, give 3%. That's between you and him. I'll never know. You know, I've, I've been here nine and a half years. I've never looked at our church financial records because it's none of my business what you give. And they know not to show it to me. So let me just ask you, if God took a look at your bank account today, would it reveal that you're all in because you're given the New Testament way between you and him cheerfully? See, that's our list of possible indicators. I don't know where you stand with anything on that list. But if, but if we do the things on that list out of devotion, they help show that we're all in.